Hello everyone. My name is Kim Lytle and I'm the Director of Research for the College. I want to welcome you all to the 2021 EHE Research Forum on behalf of the entire EHE Office of Research, Innovation and Collaboration. In a normal year during lunch, we would be in the Great Hall meeting room in the Ohio Union enjoying a Mexican fiesta. This year, many of us are having lean cuisines in our home offices. It's just not the same. However, uh, regardless of the venue, face-to-face -face or virtual, we hope that you are learning about the scope of research that is being conducted in EHE by students, staff, postdocs, and faculty, meeting new colleagues and making new connections. This year we have over almost we have over 70 presentations with almost 100 presenters. Thank you all to our presenters for creating such wonderful video presentations. We also want to thank our exhibitors that presented during the first two breaks. I hope you met the two content area librarians assigned to our college and learned more about what they have to offer. We also had the opportunity to learn more about our College Qual Lab, Quantitative Methodology Center, and Office of Equity, Diversity, and Global Engagement. OSU, OSU Career Counseling Services was also represented. We appreciate so much the faculty, staff, and graduate students that jumped into the role of session facilitator as well as room greeter for all of our exhibitors. We have two excellent keynote speakers this year and I will introduce them in a few minutes. But first I'd like to welcome the Dean of the College of Education and Human Ecology, Dean Don Pope Davis, so he can say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> Dear faculty, postdocs, students and staff. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th EHE Research Forum. This is an event I look forward to because it allows our community to see the incredible work that takes place in our college. This event has been designed to provide the opportunity for our students, faculty and staff to showcase some of the important research that our community engages in. It is an opportunity for us to make visible the scholarship that emerges from conversations that demand that we try to make a difference in the world, that we influence and change the lives of others so that we are all better people because of it. We are in a place at this moment that does not allow us to engage personally with each other. Yet the work you are presenting today clearly demonstrates that you and not are not only determined to do research that is socially that is relevant to today's issues of social justice equity and health disparity, but also are determined to make sure that the work that you do is translated into action. This is the time when we are called upon as scholars to be the change that we believe is so important and not leave it to others to merely opine about the things that are in our society. Undoubtedly, as you engage in your research, you will discover new and different questions to consider. Pursue them with a determination and a commitment because we are all counting on you to improve the lives of those who need yeah. us the most. I thank Tony Brown, Kim Lytle and Natasha Slesnick for their efforts in making this day possible. I now turn this over to Kim Lytle, who will introduce our next speakers. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Dean Pope Davis, for those words of encouragement and hope. Um, we really appreciate you being able to, to attend today's event. Uh, sorry for that little glitch, but I think we're back um, online now. Um, before I introduce our first keynote speaker, I want you to find, I want all of our attendees to find the Q&A button at the top of the page. Um, if any questions come in, or come to mind as our speakers are talking, please add your question to this section of the site. I will keep track of those questions and ask them once the speakers have finished their presentations. I'll moderate those questions as they come in. Now I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Lee, Dr. Beverly Vanderver. Dr. Vanderver is a professor in the Department of Human Sciences. She's the director of the Quantitative Methodology Center and interim executive director of the Ohio State Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. Her research interests include culturally appropriate measurement, scale development and validation, race and gender identity development and multicultural theory most notably on black racial identity. Before arriving at Ohio State and QMC, Beverly was a professor in the Department of Counselor Psychology and Counselor Education at Western Michigan University. Her presentation is entitled Navigating Research Through Council Culture. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Vanderver. Thank you, uh, Kim. Uh, thank you, Dean. And I want to thank everyone for inviting me to present at the 2021 EHE Research Forum. It's an honor to be here. 
I have a deep passion for quantitative research. So anytime anyone asks me to present on this topic, I'm always ready to go. The goal today is to challenge and stimulate critical thinking. And so you must know I like stirring the pot. Now, unfortunately, there were some glitches and difficulties of my presenting the PowerPoint, and I do have a PowerPoint. So if you would like to have a copy, feel free to email me and I will be glad to send it to you. So right now you're just going to see my animated face. So we're going to start out with some definitions first. The traditional use of the word cancel is to end, nullify, to void. The current use as it's uh, attached with culture is to call to withdraw support for like canceling public figures and companies after they've done or said something considered objectionable or offensive. This is typically performed on social media and it's labeled as a form of group shaming. The idea is to stop giving support to individuals based upon their prior attitude and our behavior considered offensive. The rationale behind cancel culture is to demand for greater accountability for public figures and others. There's a try a loss or a diminution of cultural influence or cachet and to try to reduce or deny them that attention. The problem is that at times council culture can be look like a performative aspect because it is done on social media. And so paradoxically, it may be able to amplify that was intended to squelch it, gives it more increased public attention. So when we look at the responses to cancel culture, what do you think? Some people think this is a mob mentality and it's considered to be fueled by politically progressive social media, that they see it as an erasure of history, encouraging lawlessness, muting citizens and violating the exchange of ideas, thoughts and speech. Or is it speaking truth to power? I submit that it's both. If we take a historical look uh, about council culture or uh, put it in the context of history, one of the things that we have to be aware of that the American culture has been explicitly defined as Western European, although it is implicitly defined by people from various cultures from all over the world. Other cultures were silenced or incorporated into America and relabeled as such. There has been a lack of recognition of other cultures and their people's contribution that has been one way to cancel these cultures. This approach can be observed throughout any academic discipline. Here are two examples I want to stir the pot with. One is history. Prior to the 1619th project, slavery in our history has been minimized and distorted and very little critique has been given of that matter. Uh, the 1619 project came around in 2019 where it what placed slavery and black people at the center of the U.S. history. There's a lot of cr critique about that and maybe that it, it is uh, well placed. And then in response to the 1619 project, there has been the 1776, 1776 report recentering to the founding fathers and the creation of the Republic. There has been a lot of crit critique about this one, and so rightly so. But the example shows you the juxtaposition of one uh, ideology canceling another and the tension in terms of trying to figure out a calibration that each story has merit. The other areas in psychology, in which it's my field, with the book called Even the Rat Was White by Guthrie. It delineates the history of scientific racism and psychology and the emergence of black psychology. And yet that history is so important, but it rarely is included in the history and systems of psychology classes. So when we look at cancel culture, there's some pros and cons. The pros that it's a voice for marginalized people. It's a search for accountability where justice system fails. It's a way to bring about societal change like the civil rights movement boycotts. What are the downside to council culture? It incites online bullying and violence that is disproportional to the original call out. It backfires regarding accountability. Uh, it is performative sometimes versus actual. 
It suppresses social change based on tactics used, again, performative versus actual. It can lead to intolerance, exclusion, marginalization of those who have different views, and it provides rationales to censor further marginalized voices or critics. So I'm going to take on the last piece, cancel culture and scholarship, and I have two concerns regarding it. One is ideological conformity, that if we begin to suppress ideas and research that do not comport with our beliefs, what does that mean for research? And my concern, and I'm going to call cancel culture on both sides, is not about the far right or the far left. I think both are involved in cancel culture. The far right, there's the fear of liberalizing and loosening of the moral fabric in America and the diversifying of America. For the far left, there's a fear of continued oppression by questioning any ideas or belief that do not reflect a progressive agenda. And then my second concern connected to the ideological conformity is its impact on reality and facts. We're living that reality right now about the basic element of even counting votes. What happens when scholars do not agree on basic facts and a starting point of research, given the prior preference of a Western European view of scholarship? It's a question I want you to stir the pot with. So what should we do with scholars? To cancel scholars and research, the left, the right, or both? To reckon, to consider regard with these scholars and research? I recommend the latter, not the former. Why? Do we want to become the oppressor? Oppressing those who oppressed us does not lead to liberation. Ferrieri uh, highlights that in Pedagogy of the Press, and when he talks about if you're going to overcome oppression, we must not like act like the oppressor. We need to understand the scholars and the scholarship. We need to evaluate the merits, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We need to deconstruct what aspects are useful. We should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need to reconstruct examine and test alternative ways to understand the phenomena under study. Uh, I have two other examples I want to highlight to you about that, where I see that worked out best, was the book called The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in America, came out in 1994, in which it, uh, the most controversial part was the highlight of the relationship between race and IQ and implications of inferiority, and the response to this book is critical to know. And if anybody have not read the, the responses later, I encourage you to do it. The researchers galvanize to begin to indicate what was accurate, what was inaccurate, what was the problems with the assumptions. And at this point, even though that book is still out there, there's a body of research that highlights the problems and it's worth something that would be examined and, and taught in the class. The other is the concept of eugenesis. And I noted some people here that are well known that started out as being eugenicists. And currently, as I know, then when we hear someone as being a eugenicist, people want to just cancel them all together. But in the early 1900s, it was widely promoted. They saw it as a way of possibility and progress, a remedy to host a lot of problems. And again, the response to this area is important to know because a number of the people who initially got involved in examining that research began to dismantle it. And by some of the most notable institutions in the United States at some point, they said that this was a, a, a scientific racism at its best and many places uh, have disavowed it. And, and that is still the, uh, the case for this date. And I've underlined a couple names. I missed one. Francis Galton, I missed Charles Spearman, and Ronald Fisher. All are noted scientists and statisticians. And, you know, uh, and in fact, Ronald Fisher, they've talked about quite a bit that he used his statistics in terms of, of, of promoting a, a racist methodology about uh, uh, of inferiority. But despite that, these noted people created incredible statistics, correlations, uh, factor analysis. And so again, do we throw out the baby with the bathwater? We need to understand these things in order to uh, deconstruct it, test it, and reconstruct it. 
What I've always loved about quantitative research is its complexity, not its simplicity. It does not matter to me whether my hypotheses were supported as much as how I pursued the ideas via the best methodological approaches, which are always changing. Good thinking does not change. Critical thinking does not change. It is important to split hairs, to ask questions that counter the ones hypothesized and believed. We should not be doing research to support the status quo of a respective group. We should be questioning everything. Some scholars have called for the canceling of quantitative research. One response that I've heard in the past year, it is too Eurocentric. My response, Eurocentric is not is only one lens, not a methodology. Like Afrocentric is only one lens, not a methodology. Neither set of scholars who embraces one approach over the other owns the methodology or the truth in selecting it in, in, in scientific research. It is just a lens in selecting the target population, the design, its implementation, and the interpretation of the analysis. Knowing the lens helps in understanding the conclusions drawn and the applicability to which population. Um, I'm going to give you some other examples, and some of these have to do regarding scale development, which is my area, and their guidelines regarding cumulative evidence. Uh, despite these guidelines, various psycho psychological scales have been embraced and continue to be used to this day without sufficient evidence to support such. The Rorschach test, the thematic apperception test, the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator, and the most recent one, the grit. Everybody wants to get gritty. However, only a few courageous scholars have questioned the status quo of some of this being pseudoscience. There is no support strong support for any of the measures that I mentioned. What we have been engaged in and part of the research is embracing poorly defined constructs and measures. And I'm gonna to highlight two, which I'm gonna get people gonna get upset about. One is microaggression. While that term has blown up in its everyday use in language, there is little support to support the, idea, the construct, how it's defined, and how it's measured. And Lillenfield, unfortunately, had been doing this kind of work, as I just mentioned before, had almost been labeled a racist for questioning that. The same thing goes with the grit. Uh, nationwide, schools all over the place are using it, but there's little support for that research. We also have poorly created constructs based on lack of knowledge, history, and understanding the words. I'm gonna give a couple, I'm gonna get in trouble again. Anti-Black racism is a problematic word. BIPOC versus POC. Uh, if a construct is favored by one side, the construct is supported by a preference or a bias, even the absence of evidence or scholarship to support the construct. Few scholars will raise the issues for fear of being canceled. There's a maintenance of a status quo of the preferred reality. Each camp will cancel those within their camp that question the status quo. The tools of research are not the problem. It is the developers and the users. It is us. We need to do what scholars are trained to do, expand our knowledge to understand various phenomena and understand its context and use without counseling. These are teachable moments. Quantitative methodology or positive approach is not nor has been solely the venue of the Western European scholars. Africa has the world's oldest record of human technological achievement. Who built the pyramids? Our earliest known description of the brain is from Africa. Alexander Egypt had the Library of Alexandria in which scholars from all over the world came, hence the origin of Greek science. And I, uh, I have posted and I can post some sample sources for these. My take home message is various theories and points of view exist no one should have a high road unless an accumulation of evidence says otherwise. We need to allow for competing points of views and findings, even controversial ones, even offensive ones. The history of the world is biased across all domains, either for a particular group or against another. This history should not be buried or the findings, but should be brought in open view and examined fully. Quantitative research should not be canceled. Methodology does not belong to one cultural group. Cultural issues can be quantitatively measured. There's a myth that qualitative research is the best approach for cultural research. 
All research is cultural, contextual. To believe otherwise is to say that we live in a vacuum and have not been shaped by our social context or experiences. I am concerned that education is continuing to be governed by our beliefs, not by what can be tested. Unfortunately, that has been the history of academia with the marginalization of women and people of color. All beliefs may be considered true, but for whom and for what? We need to expand our knowledge, especially in using history to understand how to approach our area of scholarship. The scientific method and quantitative methods matter to understanding the cultural lives of people and to advance the quality of life of those who have been marginalized. COVID-19 has laid bare these issues. We need to keep up with knowledge, read, read more, read even more, read broadly from all perspectives and contexts. Question what you're told, question what you read, question your experiences. Be willing to make mistakes to deal with the discomfort of not knowing or being wrong. We need to test and question the coining of new terms, constructs, new terms do not create a new reality without evidence. And finally, scholarship is an iterative process. We should build cumulative evidence in such a manner and not cancel anything, but develop understanding of the phenomena and educate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vanderver, for that thought provoking and pot stirring presentation. Um, now I would like to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Muhammad Khalifa. Dr. Khalifa is a professor of educational administration in the Department of Educational Studies and the executive director of our urban education program. He also serves as senior equity fellow at the Center for Applied Research and Educational Improvement at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> His research examines how school leaders enact culturally responsive leadership practices and authentically engage communities. His most recent book, Culturally Responsive School Leadership, inspired the development of the Culturally Responsive School Leadership Institute and academies, and he has helped districts perform equity audits as a way to address inequalities or inequities in schools. He is a former district administrator and science teacher in Detroit Public Schools and is also a leading expert of educational reform in African and Asian contexts. His presentation is entitled From Exploitation to Advocacy, Research for the Greater Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Lightley, for the uh, warm introduction. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dean uh, Pope Davis, and thank you so, so much uh, for your presentation and your speech, Dr. Uh, Vandiver. Um, I would like to pick up where you left off and share some, specific, some um, intricate details of my own journey. And uh, it overlays so perfectly with with what you said. Um, I want to make a couple of apologies before I get started. I'm in Washington, D.C. now. I'm in a hotel, uh, and this is the best that we could do. So uh, I don't have another screen. So unfortunately, uh, you all have to bear with me as I look at, at the screen. You will look at that, too. You will have to see my notes. I'm sorry I cannot make it bigger, and I'm sorry about that. I want to just apologize about that up front. Uh, but I don't have my second screen, so I can't just switch swap displays, uh, displays so easily. But um, I do want to uh, start uh, by asking, uh, which Dr. Vandiver has me thinking as well, what is the purpose of, of research? What is it? Yeah, this is a question that I think that everybody needs to start with. And the reason why is because what, what happens as researchers is that we get far away from the purpose and we get into the intricacies and to the um, the uh, the uh, tensions and the contestations of actually doing the research because uh, you know, of course doing research you have to kind of re constantly think about the I, I'm a qualitative researcher I have to say that but you you know we constantly go back and forth between the research question and our findings and the theoretical frameworks and all of that but something troubling has happened uh, 
in the past, I, I have not been in the game as long as many of my colleagues on the call, but um, something troubling has kind of happened recently in which people seem to be so focused on the process of research that they forget the end game, forgetting that research should be a means to an end and not the end. And so uh, Dr. Van, Veer, Van Der Veer said it so eloquently, people critiquing this type of research, uh, quantitative research or critiquing qualitative research. Well, what is the purpose of your research should determine the question you have, not the other way around. And so um, as I think about what the purpose of research is, I, I, I wanna think more closely about four questions in particular. Um, and so, the four questions that I'd like to, uh, you know, share with my, my students in the, in the College of Education is how am I located within my work? How is my work accessible to those I investigate? How do I move from exploration and impact to advocacy? Impact and advocacy are not the same thing, okay? Exploration is certainly not the same thing as even impact, and I see those as a progression of continuum. And how do I remain scientific yet decolonial and non-exploitative? Because what research generally looks like is that, you know, we go into a part of a city, we collect data about people. They never see benefit. They never see benefit that they can see and that they could articulate from the research that we're doing in their communities. We go, we look at them, we ask them, Sometimes we raise expectations and then we walk away with our publication and we walk away with our research. But if that's how we are approaching research, how is that any different from a colonial way of investigation? How is that different from exploitation uh, in the way that many earlier researchers from the European continent went to Asia, went to Africa, went to Latin America and did research for the benefit of empire and for the benefit of European countries? And so if we are not careful and we leave off the second part of the question number four, then we run the risk of reinforcing very oppressive trends with communities right here in Cleveland or Columbus or uh, Youngstown, Ohio and such in Detroit. I was a teacher in Detroit public schools and I saw this happen. Uh, my colleagues were used to people from, and I'm not beating up on the University of Michigan or anything like that. I was an undergraduate student at Michigan. And my colleagues uh, and, and DPS, I was an educator, became really quite accustomed to researchers coming from the University of Michigan, doing research, staying with us for a year, and then absolutely everything drying up when they were able to present their um, uh, research findings. And so I'd like to start as I as I pass through these questions and I'm trying to model these questions and think through them myself. Uh, I'd like to start at a moment uh, much earlier and I want I want to start at where this scientific side discovery process really took root as it pertains to Western civilization. Of course, um, the I would argue that the first universities in the world, the first uh, time that many of the systems upon which Western civilization uh, is built, Western civilizations are built, came out of Andalusia. That would be the Moorish African held part of Spain and um, Portugal, parts of France, G Gibraltar. And so here in this civilization, which Europeans called the, at the same time that Europeans called themselves to be in the dark ages, these Moorish people from the continent of Africa who went across the Mediterranean and occupied that part of Europe for 800 years, it was not it was not even close to the Dark Ages for them. They are, in fact, the ones who invented the scientific method. The notion of what zero is, running water in bathrooms, oceanography, uh, algebra, physics, the first books of Tib, Kotobo Tib, this, this really corpus of work came out of a time that Europeans described Europe, even though this was a part of Europe, as the Dark Ages. By point of comparison, white Western Europe at that time may have produced a thousand books across that we have evidence of. And these African, mainly Muslims and Jews who came out of North Africa and crossed the Mediterranean, wrote between 500 million and a billion books at the same amount of time that it was described as the Dark Ages. But what what I want to tease out, what I want to tease out is 
Why were they doing this work? See, I would argue that these researchers never ever, again, the people who invented, they were, they were scientific. They, they are the ones that introduced to humanity how we write most of our dissertations in this whole scientific method business. So they were very scientific. But what is, why were they scientific is the question. They didn't stop at just the exploration and investigation. They always linked it back to uh, people being more human and to improving the lives, lives of people on this planet. And that is why there was never a contradiction with their faith in science. Okay, and so what happened is that after they ruled for 800 years, Isabella comes back and she retakes this part of Europe. And I'm sorry for going historical and I will make my comments brief, but she retakes this part of Europe and she claims it for herself and for the church because of course they represented God. Now I'm not speaking about faith here. I'm just speaking about people using faith in order to uh, justify their own means. And what she says is that well, we have to enslave these people. We have to kill them or excommunicate them. They have to go back even after 800 years, right? They have to go back. Uh, and if not, we will keep them in a system of encomienda because they're not really uh, worthy of, of having this land or any land for them. And in fact, the Catholic Church retook the entire world for them. And they claimed that all people and all resources and all lands were owned by the church. So anyway, this debate happens in 1552, the Valladolid debates where you have De La Casas saying that, hold on a second, he actually accompanied Columbus. And he says, we, we, we claim we're Christians. We cannot go to Cuba or Jamaica and kill within a matter of two hours, 20,000 people from the age of two or three days old up until someone 100 years old, just kill them all. And then his opponent in the debate, this 1552 debate in the city of Valladolid of Spain, uh, responds that you're right. We cannot do this to people. But these beings are not people because if they are not having, if they don't have a God, then if they, if they don't have a God, then they don't have a soul. They don't have a religion. They don't have a God. And if they don't have a God, they don't have a soul. So since they're soulless, they're subhuman. This is the first time in, that we know of in humanity that the status of being human, because see a lot of, I work with a lot of districts across the country and they always wanna say, Dr. Khalifa, come and let's do anti-bias work. I'm like, well, where are your biases from? Let's go back a little bit further than just you coming in the door uh, and wanna go back to the civil rights era, let's go back. And so this is the first time that people were described, but, but by the way, De La Casas' argument was not much better. He said, no, no, they're human. They are humans, but they're savages. So we just have to desavagize them by Christianizing them. Okay. And so this debate really puts into full focus the difference in why peoples, Europeans versus early people, early that even engage in the scientific process in the first place and why they even engage in exploration. And how could it be that now, some four or 500 years later, you have doctoral students across America not even reconciling their own research histories with these earlier histories that research can be served for any purpose. Exactly to Dr. Vanderveer's point, it's not the methodology. It's the purpose of your reason. Why are you there? Why are you seeking this? If you're seeking it for a position, if you're seeking it for a job, if you're seeking it just out of curiosity, you very well could just be a part of the problem that we as researchers who rest our research trajectories on earlier ways of existing and not empire based ways of existing. And so I got my, I told you, I told many of you, I want to share a personal story with you. I'm watching the time too. I see you, uh, Dr. Light, uh, looking at me, but I am aware of the time. Uh, I did all of this. I won't go into each individual one, but you know, essentially in my research, I look at, uh, principles and how principles can serve their communities because we're asking the same question really one could show up in a space about a school leader and just start talking about instructional leadership and budgeting and you could be very positivist you could disconnect from the community you could disconnect to why you're there you know i look at in my research how did african americans show up in schools before 1954 like, why were they there? Many of them, as uh, Vanessa Siddle Walker and other researchers, Jerome Morris, illustrate, many of them were community leaders first. 
But even those who were not necessarily community leaders, they were there to advocate for the humanity of their communities. And so I'm taking the same frame, okay, to us as researchers. And I'm asking, is my research accessible to those I serve? For example, who is interpreting the work that you're doing? Are, are you going to, are, are you, so this is why colonialism is so important and racial capitalism, right? <clears throat> are you telling me with this, some of the history, and there's, there's expansive history on this. You should read Martin Bernal. You should read Ivan Van Sertema. So many people, you should definitely visit the works of Ramon gross Fugel and uh, others who write about this, this pre-colonial era that shaped how we ask questions and why we ask questions, because that can't be forgotten. But, you know, how are you telling me that you're willing to go to a portion of Columbus, Ohio, and you want to research in a population, right? And you don't want to even ask them if they agree with how you're interpreting them. Then you want to go and publish it in a research journal that even me, I don't have access to most, some of the journals that we publish in. I have to request. So you know they don't have access to it. And, e and even if they did, what language is it written in? And even if they could A, get access, and they could understand that language, and I'm not, I'm not uh, deficitizing, I mean, there's geniuses. Uh, this says nothing about the communities. This says something about our own writing. There are geniuses in every community. But if we're using terms that they don't use, they, well, they're not going to know that term. So you, they can't get access. Then the language is not uh, written for a broader audience. All right. And then even if they read it, they may not even agree with it. But even if they read it and agreed with it and understood the language, how does it change their day to day situation? How does it lean, lend more humanity as these earlier researchers did? How does it lead to more liberation for their communities. What do they want in their communities? And that is exactly why we have to ask the question of not just what is the impact? Because see, this word impact is tricky. We have to be very careful. This word impact could mean, well, um, we're gonna, you know, if we get this particular research study, we'll be able to determine what will increase, right? A, B, and C. Now. The question I have is, do the communities you serve and that you're researching, so you have to locate yourself in your community. That's the first thing. But do those uh, that how you as a researcher define impact, does that equal how people that you're studying also define impact? That's why impact and advocacy are two different things, because see, with advocacy, you show up in the community, you learn from the community, you learn what they need, and then you can easily, more easily articulate, okay, now here is how I can advocate for what this community wants. Here is how I can not just treat research, okay, as uh, an exercise in exploration and get that PhD, but here's how I can truly make a difference for the people that uh, because they've told me that this is important to them. So you're learning from them. And so so um, the questions, what are the community based goals? How do they need uh, what do they need, especially as it pertains to the study? So I'm not asking you to give up your interests. I'm not asking you to be less scientific, but I am asking you to contextualize your research in broader lenses than the four people on your dissertation committee. Right. And you can you can still have a kick behind division award winning, I would argue, uh, research dissertation and still advocate for people and not be exploitative and walk away from the community when your study finishes without being committed to anything, right? And so, so uh, why is this important? If you are not willing to do this, then you run the risk of doing some things that people at places like Harvard University have done. And so for example, the types of man, all right? So studies by Gideon Knott, 1854, to Dr. Vanderveer's point, in which it was argued that white people were more intelligent because of the skull size. Now, raise your hand, raise your, your vi virtual hand if you don't know some real big headed white people who are not so intelligent. And raise your hand if you don't know some kind of like small headed black people who are geniuses. So, 
This entire rigmarole and Samuel Morton studies and all of these eugenic studies because it didn't make much sense for you to continue oppressing people in the way before. So now you need a scientific justification with researchers like us in order to justify that because they never checked their contexts. They never checked their own epistemologies. And so therefore, nobody even said that bigger heads me meant more intelligent, but because you're already slanted and you've not been engaging your epistemologies, you show up and make systematic errors every single time the same skulls are examined. And what do you find? You find that white skulls are bigger, so they're more intelligent, and that darker people have smaller skulls every single time. And this is what, and again, these people were at Harvard University. They were the most respected scientists in the world. Okay? So it's important that we are aware of that. And again, the one, one thing that, especially, I know we have a lot of our international um, students on the call. And, you know, I've done a lot of international work. And when I go to, um, you know, the global south, which I prefer uh, to engage in different research or, you know, delegations or teaching or whatever, I, I always encounter, not always, but I'd say mostly I encounter international scholars who studied in institutions in the U.S., right, who are literally asking me to aid them in colonizing research in their own lands. And it's not because these people that I have encountered are insidious or have bad intentions. In fact, when you talk to them, most of them have good intentions, right? But it's because they have not been able to connect their research activities with non-exploitative and with non-Western ways of knowing and, and, and investigating. And that is the challenge. And it happens differently, as Dr. Van Der Veer said, it happens dis differently in every discipline. If somebody wants to do something with statistics, or if they want to do, uh, as Margaret Mead here, which many of you know, if they want to do anthropological work, let them choose the method that allows them to assist people the most and answer the questions that they want the most. And I know I'm over time, and I apologize for that, but it's been good having you. Thank you again for the invitation, and I will end there and stop sharing my screen. So, um, so I can both uh, Dr. Khalifa and Dr. Vanderveer, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Okay. Well, I believe that we had another glitch for our Q and A. So there are no specific questions that came in. Um, and again, thank you for your patience and for um, the grace that you are giving us, uh, everyone, for this um, interface. Uh, both of those presentations were thought-provoking, pot-stirring, and uh, it seemed, you know, exactly true to form. Uh, Dr. Vandiver, would you like to add anything? Um, or Dr. Khalifa, I mean, either one of you, would you like to make any additional comments? Well, the only thing that I would say is that I hope that uh, whatever, as Dr. Khalifa says, research endeavor that people decide to engage in, it is important for uh, people to really dive in deep. Uh, my concern about education is that with the voluminous amount of information we have, it is really easy to sort of skim the surface. And skimming the surface, I believe, has resulted in just poor conclusions being drawn. And I think the deeper you get into information, you're able to understand the nuances better and also to speak to a better truth and uh, to a better reality. And so that's what's been concerning for me about mo uh, uh, social media, about canceling, about all these things. It's not that they don't have a point. It is the point is just hitting the surface and it needs to really go deeper. So, yes, there are people who have been a eugenicist and that's been horrible. But it's also important to see the people's responses to that. 
because then that means that you get to have an understanding of that complexity. Uh, and, and even there were questions at time whether even e. B., uh, W. E. B. Du Bois was a eugenicist, but you'd have to understand their thinking at the time was it, it rooted in a moment, not of just the racism, but also trying to understand ways to make the life better for people. And when you understand that, and then you figure that they get out of that path, then you can appreciate better versus making it so binary that they're either bad or evil. There's some bad people out here, but not everybody's like that. I like Dr. Khalifa's mention of bad intentions. I think some people are just oblivious um, to what the impact or the lack of uh, or the choices they're making. What what is the impact on the population or just in general? Um, so, Dr. Khalifa, would you like to add anything else? No, you know, uh, I, I, I'm just humble about the invitation and um, we could talk about this all day. One of the ways that uh, one of the things that Dr. Vendiver said that really struck me is uh, the opportunity that our students would have to kind of redefine terms that are given to them. Um, you know, uh, th this I, I like what she said about blackness. Uh, I was I was in a city uh, most recently before Ohio State in which for whatever reason, the institution uh, decided to uh, put black, have, have a broad category of black, right? As they were kind of trying to figure, figure out this equity question. And in that you had black folks from North Minneapolis who could be compared to the poorest black city in any part of the country. And you had the, the uh, second generation children of West African immigrants, which are the most, uh, the, the highest performing group of students in the country above even Asian American students. I mean, second generation West African. So here you have one category of black, right? Including everybody in there so that you can claim that the black enrollment is this or that while you are further oppressing the very people that you claim that this whole thing is to help, right? Because now you, can, you, you don't have to find alternative ways in order to kind of grow that population because you've got a, a stand in black. And you know this, this. This is exactly why terms. You know this term of equality. Most most people doing research can walk away from this district saying that, you know, as long as they have parity, you know, in data and for example test score data, as long as they have parity in disciplinary uh, score data, then researchers and educators walk away saying, check, we've got equity. But what does it mean for the communities? Right. How is that? What if, they, what if their children had to give up everything about their being in order for you as a researcher to say equity was achieved? Are you happy with that? And that, that's exactly why we have to go into communities and we have to go much deeper, just like you were saying, Dr. Lightly. Um, so. Yeah. All right, well, this was wonderful presentations. I hope, I mean, it makes me think about the context and, and the intentions that I have that are not bad uh just uninformed so we all need to really think deeply about um the research that we're doing um so i want to say everyone to everyone thank you so much for uh join us joining us for this uh lunch keynote presentation um we've got one more session to go that starts at 1:15. Uh, you can go back to the virtual conference space and click on any of those join meeting links. And uh, again, thanks everyone for being patient and kind. And um, we really appreciate that you've taken the time to join us. Thank you so much. Be blessed.